Good morning. And welcome to this gathering of Christ Fellowship Church of Williamsburg. Praise the Lord for his goodness to us and giving us this new year, 2023. Happy New Year. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we are thrilled that you have chosen to join us to worship the Lord today. And we'd invite you to stay with us after the service uh, for five minutes, ten minutes. Sometimes it's even an hour. Uh, you'll see folks fellowshipping afterward. You're welcome to stay as long as you'd like. Uh, stay around with us so we can get to know you better and so that uh, you can get to know us better as well. We are a church that loves Jesus and seeks to exalt him in everything we do. And that's the most important thing you can know about us. Uh, but please uh, stay after and learn, learn more after the service today. Uh, we welcome those who are joining us via live stream in Building 7000 right over there. Uh, please come on over to Building 5000 so you can see us in person after the service. Uh, on January 21st, that's a Saturday, from 9 to 11.30 a.m., we will have a membership class. Now, a membership class is just a time where one of our pastors will walk through the class, uh, through the statement of faith, which is what we believe as a church, as well as our membership commitment, uh, which basically defines how we hope to live life together as a church. Uh, we understand that the Christian life is not lived uh, alone. There's no such thing as a lone ranger Christian, but that all Christians are called to join into one local church, one gathering uh, of Christians to help one another make it to heaven. So the membership class is basically our way of explaining how we seek to do that as a church. Uh, so again, that's January 21st, uh, Saturday, 9 to 11.30 a.m. Uh, if you'd like to RSVP, you can let me know, and uh, we can get you squared away with that as well. Uh, as you were entering this morning, you saw this beautiful uh, lost and found table, which was clearly uh, put out by a man and not a woman, uh, seeing how... Um, <laughs> beautiful it appears. Uh, we invite you to look at that table after the service and check to see if there's anything that might belong to you and then grab it and take it with you so that we don't have to keep it in the back anymore. Uh, that would be great. Uh, we've already had a couple of items taken, so we thank you for that. But please do check that table after the service. Uh, this time, uh, Peter Hess, our pastor, is going to come and introduce uh, some of our missionaries overseas. One of the things that we like to do regularly, as much as we can, is hear from uh, our supported workers, those that are overseas for the sake of the name. And this morning, Matt and Haley, who serve the Lord in North Africa, are going to be sharing with us. It's about a five-minute video update for us to let us know how they're doing. Uh, you can take notes and use what they're saying as a way to be praying for them in particular. Now, where they serve the Lord is in a, a closed area, and so we want to be careful in terms of any kind of information that we would share. We wouldn't share anything about them on social media or anything like that. Actually, you'll be able to see the video, but anyone watching on live stream will not be able to see the video. We're going to keep the TVs out of that so that they'll only be able to hear the voices. Uh, but this is an opportunity for us to hear from Matt and Haley, how they're doing, how we can pray for them, and let's, uh, let's use this time to the fullest by actually writing down or thinking about what they're saying so that we can pray for them in coming days. Merry Christmas from North Africa. Middle from East. the Curtis family. <laughs> yeah, we wanted to send you guys a quick update and um, we miss you all. We hope you're all just enjoying this season to celebrate. Um, so we're going to try and answer a couple of questions. First off, how are we doing? Uh, we're doing well. We've had some recent visits that have been encouraging and we've really enjoyed. And right now we have Amelia here with us. So that's a big, big plus. We're doing, yeah, doing great. We're doing really good. We've had about three or four groups or small groups come in kind of back to back. Um, all very encouraging and meaningful, and then just celebrate that we have three of our five daughters with us, and that is a sweet gift from above. So thankful, encouraged, um, yeah, on the mountaintop for a lot of reasons. So what's been going on with us um, lately? Um, so we had a new brother, uh, one we've been praying for, uh, sharing with for quite some time. He was dug last month. So we've been excited about that and uh, just praying that uh, the Lord protects him and keeps him. Yes, and you all have been lifting him up, I think, too. So it was just such a neat encouragement um, to be part of that, all of um, 
above rejoices when one comes and, and we were with tears rejoicing. Um, and we are excited about the trip coming up. We are very excited about it. Um, and our home, our plant is, um, we just covenanted together and that was really meaningful and um, precious to see our new plant come together, covenant, um, testimony time, and um, just studying the word together. I think there's close to 20 of us now joined together and meeting regularly and um, just worshiping together and hearing God's word together. And that's been awesome. Yeah, the leadership team has come together. We're, um, we're seeking a full-time teaching leader. Um, so if you could lift that up, that would be great. And we're just going to go right into different ways to lift up um, us as we want to lift you all up um, as well. So uh, for the Language Center, uh, we're still needing space and we're needing English students. And that may sound a little bit um, paradoxical, but we need the space to get the students. We need the students to uh, justify the space. Yes, we're almost maxed out, actually. Um, and yet we still would love to have, um, if Father wills it, that net to be cast a little, a little bit um, wider. And we have started, um, just 2023 is looking like it's just kind of almost booked for different, um, different, we'll call them tour groups coming in. And that has been encouraging and wonderful to see, um, just see the students go out with them and engage and share most important things and share life together. And um, there's a lot of seeds that have been planted and that's really neat and questions and relationships going. And that's what we've been lifting up and asking for, as well as our staff there. There's been um, some neat things that have been happening the last few weeks. And so we're encouraged by that um, and excited to share more when we have you people on the ground with all of that. And the last thing that we would ask for as we come, um, we celebrate Christmas here uh, tomorrow as we're recording this. And uh, we're looking forward to a week of rest, <laughs> uh, a week away from uh, the work that we're doing uh, daily. Um, and um, so you can, you can pray to the Father for us that we do have a truly restful time uh, where we're restored uh, and, uh, and get the rest that we need. Yes, like probably many of you, uh, we recently were in a um, chapter of John and just reminded how um, even in the darkness there is light and that he has overcome all things. Um, but we are seeing just more light in this darkness here. And so I hope you all are encouraged um, as the light will shine forth. Um, we love in John, we were reminded that there is grace and there is truth and grace and grace upon grace. So that's going to be um, one thing we're going to lift up for you all, that you're experiencing a fresher, sweeter, deeper um, grace upon grace upon grace with truth. Um, and that's what the sun was all about. So thank you all for, for uh, faithfulness. And we look forward to seeing um, some of you in about two and a half weeks or countdown. So we love you all. And thank you. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. That's encouraging, isn't it? We're going to have a, uh, a team that's going to North Africa share with us next week uh, from our church so that we know how to be praying for them as they prepare kind of final preparations for that time. And uh, what an encouraging thing that we get to be a part of supporting these faithful workers, but then also this, uh, this new body of believers that has come together in that city that desperately needs the gospel. It's a huge encouragement. There's one other thing that we want to do or that I want to do this morning is the, my time here during announcements, I guess, is just to recognize one brother that served our church very well. The Bible tells us in Romans 12, verse 11, uh, that we should love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. So that's not optional. That's a command. Praise God for that command. And outdo one another in showing honor. So it should be a competition for our church to see if we can honor one another more well, a brother that has served our church very well for the last three and a half years through music is Jason Bain. Uh, he has done just countless amount of work, and just hours and 
practices and putting together schedules and putting together music and working with me, making decisions, and been very, very grateful for Jason for the work that he's done. So I'm going to have Jason come up here. Uh, he didn't know we were doing this because we kept it a surprise. And we did a good job with that surprise, didn't we? Very good. Yeah, brother. We love you. We want to express our appreciation for you, for what you've done for us. And I believe that is my portion, so I will sit down. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Peter. Brothers and sisters, let's now take a few moments to quiet our hearts and seek the Lord in prayer as we prepare to worship the living God. And after a moment, I will read God's word, and God's word will pierce through that silence and call us to worship. <clears throat> Rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in everything. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, we praise you as the everlasting and holy God. Lord, you are from eternity past. Lord, you have created all things, and you are in the process of redeeming all things back into what you designed them to be. Lord, as we see ahead of us this new year, we acknowledge that new year as a gift from your hand, and we know that the New Year's holiday is a way of remembering that you are making all things new, and that even what we do this morning and what you do in us is a small celebration of that, that new creation work you are doing. Lord, prepare our hearts to worship you. Let us be men and women this year who rejoice, who pray, who give thanks in all circumstances. We pray all this. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning, one of the great themes we'll be meditating on in God's word is the need for God's people to be a praying people. Peter will be preaching later from Luke chapter 18, where we will see five exhortations toward prayer in the new year. But to begin our service, we're going to be singing two songs that help orient us with that theme, two songs that really describe the gospel which is the means by which God makes us his praying people. So come behold the wondrous mystery and the church's one foundation tell us just that story. So stand as God's people and let's sing out in praise to God and encouragement to one another.
Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes. Amen. The church is one foundation is Jesus Christ her As you're seated, Seth Alden is going to come and read for us from Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. It's a wonderful passage that teaches us about Paul's heart for proclaiming Christ. Colossians 4, 2 through 6. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. It's so clear when you uh, read the Apostle Paul that he's just passionate to proclaim Christ and everything that he's doing, and even ask for prayer for that, Well, one of the ways that we get to proclaim Christ as a church is when we together sing out praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to do now. Stand with me together. We're going to sing two songs of praise to Christ. We're going to sing, all I have is Christ and all glory be to Christ. And let's proclaim Christ together as we sing these songs. Oh 
Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus is my life. Amen. Please be seated. Children, if you're participating in True Seekers, you're dismissed to meet your teachers at this time.
And the Christ that we've just proclaimed is the Lord of glory, who even now is seated at the right hand of the Father. It's through him that we have access to the Father. It's through him that we can bring our praises and our petitions. As we begin this new year, it's very significant, isn't it, that we made it through 2022, and the Lord Jesus is with us in 2023. And let's go to him in prayer, praising him and thanking him for his grace. Let's pray to our God. Lord God, we praise you this morning that you're the God who hears prayer. Uh, Lord, you're the God who's always heard the prayer of your people. You heard Abraham when he cried out for an heir. And you answered that prayer, and you gave him Isaac, the son of promise. And you heard David's prayer when he asked for deliverance from Saul. And you gave him deliverance. You answered that prayer, and you made him king over all of Israel. And you heard Daniel's prayer when he was thrown into a lion's den, and it seemed that he would die. And yet you heard his prayer and closed the mouth of the lion. And you're the same God today. You're the God who hears prayers. You're the God who hears our prayers and we praise you for that. Lord, you're God who not only hears, but you answer. And sometimes your answer to us is yes, because what we're praying lines up with your will, and it's good for our souls. But sometimes your answer is no, because you know in your wisdom that we don't need the things we're asking for, or what, what we're asking for would even harm us spiritually. And sometimes you tell us to wait, because you want to you wanna form a, a perfect Christ-like patience in us. But Lord, we thank you this morning and we praise you this morning because we can have complete confidence that when we pray to you, you hear us and you always respond. Lord, when we think about what a privilege it is to talk to you as the King of kings and Lord of lords, we are amazed at how slow we are to pray. And so we confess our lack of prayerfulness to you. Lord, we profess to believe that prayer gives us access to the very God of eternity, but all too often we treat prayer like it's simply a religious duty, uh, something we have to do, and not the great privilege that it is. And because that's the case, Lord, it's quite often that we are, are formal and cold and even rushing through prayer, trying to get on to things that we feel like in the moment are more important. And so we don't spend time with you, our Father, and we ask your forgiveness for that. Lord, we confess that often we are very slow to pray, and we rush to end praying. We just can't wait to get on to other things. Lord, would you teach us to value that sweet time with you? Uh, would you show us our need, Lord? Uh, part of the problem is just our pride, uh, that we think we can do something apart from you, uh, that we think there's something better in this world than dwelling in your presence. God, would you help us to understand what your word teaches us about the privilege that prayer is? And Lord, we pray along with the disciples, teach us to pray. Lord, we thank you as we look at this new year, 2023. We don't want to go into this new year without thanking you for all that you did for us in 2022. We thank you for feeding and clothing and sheltering us every day last year. We thank you for that. We thank you for healing us when we became sick. Lord, or for giving us patience and grace to endure the, the long-standing illnesses you permitted in our lives. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that in 2022, you fed us through your word. Uh, both in our own devo devotions, corporately as a church, you were faithful, uh, Lord, by your spirit to feed us spiritually so we had strength to live for you through your word. We thank you for that. And we thank you for the way you have blessed our church so richly over the last year. Thank you for the spiritual growth that we've seen in our own lives. Lord, it's so slow. We long to grow more quickly. And yet, when we look back over the last year, many of us can say that we have seen spiritual growth, and we are so grateful for that, Lord God. We thank you for financial provision. Uh, we thank you for wisdom that you have given us as you've guided us through the year. We thank you for sustaining this church. And we ask, Lord God, that you would continue the work that you're doing here, helping us by your grace to be more humble, more trusting, more dependent. And Lord God, we're praying that you would use our church in 2023. We pray for the nations of the world this morning. We pray especially for the nation of Zimbabwe. With 15 million people, there's a huge AIDS crisis there. Uh, notorious governmental corruption over recent decades has led to a broken economy. And yet your church is in Zimbabwe, and your children need your help. And Lord, we're praying for that. We are asking, Lord God, that you would provide food 
and clothing and shelter for them in that nation. Uh, we pray more especially that you would provide them with healthy churches and with faithful shepherds who would point them to Christ so that our brothers and sisters have all that they need for life and for eternity. God, as we begin 2023, we pray for President Joe Biden. We ask, Lord God, that you would help him and his family uh, to experience health. Uh, we pray most especially for his soul. Uh, Lord, we pray for him to be saved. We ask, Lord God, that you'd bring people around him who'd share the gospel with him. And he is not so far out of your reach that you cannot save. We pray that you would. Lord, we ask that you would keep him from enacting policies that dishonor you, that would harm the spread of the gospel, that would harm families, that would harm unborn children. We pray, Lord God, that there would be a restraint upon policies that are overtly evil. We pray, Lord God, that you would do a good work. We pray for President Biden asking you to do good to him. We pray, Lord, this morning for Reformation Christian Fellowship and for Pastor Kenny Diaria in our community, a brother that loves you, uh, with elders who love you. And as they together pastor Reformation Christian Fellowship, we're asking that you would build that church up, be with them as they are concluding their budget process, as they're considering whether or not to join with the Pillar Church Network, uh, as they're seeking wisdom to know how to disciple their young men and young women, as they seek the salvation of their children as they try to reach out to their community. Lord God, would you bless this church? Would you help Reformation Christian Fellowship to become more and more the church you would have them to be? We thank you for what we saw this morning. Matt and Haley sent out from us, now joined together with a new church in their city. We praise you for that. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would bless them. We pray that you would be with this new uh, brother who has professed faith. Uh, Lord, we're so grateful uh, that another soul has followed Christ and been willing to be baptized. Lord God, we are asking that this individual would know your favor, uh, your protection, and your help. Uh, he or she has turned back on the world at great personal cost. Uh, Lord, be, be far more than the world to him or her uh, and help them to grow and to know you. We pray that you would do that. Lord, we pray that Matt and Haley would know a season of rest Lord, as they've been resting, we trust over the last week, we would ask, Lord God, that they would continue to know rest, and you would remind them that rest doesn't come from rest. Rest comes from Jesus. He's the one that gives true rest, rest to our souls, so help them to rest in him. And Lord God, as we consider the matter of prayer this morning as a church, we are asking that you would help us through your word, uh, be a church that, that has a culture of prayer, uh, which is very normal for us to be praying for one another daily and praying with one another uh, when we meet. Uh, Lord, we pray that our church corporately would gather, and pray, and ask great things of you. We're praying that our worship services would be marked by seasons of prayer where you would be lifted high. Uh, we're praying that you would teach us, Lord, this most difficult, it seems like this most difficult of lessons to pray. So, Lord, increase our faith this morning as we study your word together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you would turn with me to Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 18, we're going to be in the gospel of Luke this morning uh, to give you some idea of where we're going next week. Lord willing, we'll be returning to our series in Revelation, but as I uh, traditionally have done the first Sunday uh, that I preach in a new year, we have a new year sermon uh, focused especially on what I'm praying the Lord will do, what the elders are praying the Lord will do in our church in this year, and this year we are focused on this issue of fervent and persistent prayer. We're asking the Lord God to build up a culture of prayer in our church, and we're praying that, that this sermon would be a part of that, that God would use this time together in his word to do that. So uh, Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8 is our text this morning. If you're able, please stand with me out of respect for God's word, and I will read that to us. Now he, that is Jesus, told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. There was a judge in a certain town who didn't fear God or respect people. And a widow in that town kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he was unwilling, but later he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice 
so that she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Then the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay helping them? I tell you, he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is our passage for us this morning. Please be seated. And please let me say, Happy New Year to all of you. Sometimes I get in this work phase and I, you know, Happy New Year. It's great to see you all this morning. It's wonderful to be back with you. Uh, we missed you last weekend. We had a great time with family, but it's wonderful to see all of you this morning and to be back with you. Well, as we think about prayer, uh, one of the things that I thought about in terms of my own life was an experience I had shortly after Missy and I arrived on the field in Central Asia as new missionaries. And we arrived just in time to join with a group of missionaries, really kind of from all throughout Central Asia, who are gathering together for a week of hearing from God's Word and fellowshipping together. It's a general meeting that they had. Now, most of the missionaries were Americans, but there were some missionaries from other nations. Uh, and there was a portion, kind of a sizable portion, of the group that was from the nation of Korea. So several missionaries were from Korea. And for the most part, the week was really encouraging. Uh, the Bible teaching was solid. We enjoyed a good time of singing together, and we enjoyed a lot of good time of just fellowshipping with one another. But something happened during that week that was really convicting for me personally. I had been hanging out with some American missionaries at the pool and spending time with them, and I was on my way back to the room. And as I was walking down the hall, I saw a door opened. And when I looked through the door, I saw a bunch of Korean missionaries but they weren't just hanging out like we had been. They were on their knees praying fervently. And they were praying for their own souls, for spiritual strength or the tasks that God had entrusted to them. And they were praying for the salvation of Central Asian Muslims. And looking at that room full of praying Koreans, it occurred to me that I hadn't prayed like that with any of the American missionaries. And I began to wonder if, if maybe I was missing out on God's best for the week. Maybe God's best wasn't just good Bible teaching and times of fellowship together. Maybe, maybe God's best for us that week included what these Korean missionaries were doing, which was fervent prayer to God, asking Him to be at work in them and through them. It, it seems like as Americans that we excel at work and we excel at strategy, but, but maybe we needed to grow in prayer and since that time, I wish I could say that I'd mastered the spiritual discipline of prayer. I wish I could tell you that every time I go to prayer, I'm always uh, focused and I'm not distracted. I wish I could say that, that um, when I'm praying, I, I find myself just longing to begin and longing to continue. But, but even as I just prayed a few minutes ago, I often start very slowly and I finish very quickly because something has very suddenly become very, very important. And I need to stop praying so that I can do that very, very important thing that didn't seem so important before I started praying. And so I'm still a learner in the school of prayer. And perhaps some of you are as well. And if that's the case, then I'm praying that this sermon this morning from this passage will be an encouragement to me and will be an encouragement to you uh, that we would be those that are persistent, uh, dogged even, in our pursuit of our God through prayer, uh, that we would grow through, the, that we would grow in kind of having a fervent and persistent prayer life. Now, we need that as individual Christians, but the reality is, is that fervent and persistent prayer isn't only for individual Christians, it's for the church as a whole. Uh, the church as a whole should be characterized by a, a deep prayerfulness. This should be something that we see in our lives together corporately, and so I'm praying that this sermon will be an encouragement to our church as a whole, that in 2023, uh, no matter what our 2022 was like, in 2023, we will be growing in this matter of prayer, and especially that we would be persistent in it and fervent in it. I'm praying that God will convict us where we need to be convicted. I'm praying that He will encourage us where we need to be encouraged. I'm praying that He'll strengthen us so that we will walk in obedience to Him and enter into what is truly blessing. And blessing is being with Jesus. It's spending time with the Savior. Let me give you some background on Luke before we jump into this chapter 18. Uh, the Gospel of Luke was written by Luke, who was a close associate of the Apostle Paul. 
And it was his task, it was his desire to put together a gospel. What's a gospel? Well, a gospel is simply a, a biography of Jesus. It's a proclamation of what God has done through Jesus to provide salvation for sinners. And Luke's purpose in particular is stated for us at the very beginning of the gospel. The very beginning, the first little section there in Luke 1. He says, many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. So it also seemed good to me, since I've carefully investigated everything from the very first, to write to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. So his purpose was to write an orderly account of the life of Jesus. You see, Jesus isn't a myth. He's not just a collection of stories that you can make up. There's actually a sequence to his life because he's a historical individual who lived the most remarkable of lives. He's writing this letter, this ultimately this book, for a man named Theophilus because he wanted Theophilus to have certainty about the faith that he had embraced. And of course, through the Holy Spirit, this is inspired and is inspired for the church of all times. And so through the gospel of Luke, we can have certainty about our faith, about what we believe as well. Now, Luke's account of the life of Jesus is particularly thorough. Uh, he gives us details about the birth of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus, even the resurrection of Jesus that are not found in any of the other Gospels. In our passage for study this morning in chapter 18, verses 1 to 8, it's one of those details. Here the Lord Jesus gives us a parable. Uh, it's a, a heavenly story. Excuse me, it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's a parable that is not included in any other Gospel. It's a parable that teaches us about the need for fervent and for persistent prayer. Now, the broader context of this parable is important because Jesus is doing something here. If you look kind of at your copy of God's Word, what comes just before this parable, the context is always important. Uh, chapter 17, verses 20 to 27, what, what Jesus is doing in that passage is he's talking about his second coming. He's giving details to his disciples about what it will be like when he comes again. So that's the broader context. Jesus is teaching about his second coming, and it becomes very clear in that teaching that there will be a period of time that will transpire before Jesus comes again, and it's during that time, okay? It's during that period of waiting between Christ's first coming and Christ's second coming. It's that period of time in which we live right now where believers must be prayerful, where we must be characterized by fervent and persistent prayer. So Christ gives his disciples and us this parable to teach us about our need for prayer. And as we study this passage together this morning, we're going to do a brief exposition of the parable, and then we're going to focus our hearts on five exhortations that flow out of this parable. Five exhortations. If you're taking notes, first exhortation from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8, is that believers must pray. Believers must pray. Second exhortation, believers should pray persistently. Third exhortation is that believers should pray fervently. Uh, the fourth exhortation is that believers should pray confidently. And the fifth exhortation is that believers should pray urgently. So we will go through each one of those as we work our way through this passage. Let's look first at verses 1 to 8, kind of more specifically. Uh, the point of this parable it's up front in verse 1. Jesus tells us up front what the point of the parable is. He says, now he told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. So the parable is about prayer. It's the need that we have to persevere in prayer. It's the need that we have to not give up when we pray or not to give up prayer. Now, Jesus says pray always there, but that doesn't indicate that Christians should literally be praying all the time. For one thing, that's impossible. For another thing, it would keep us from doing many of the other things that the Lord Jesus has called us to do. So what does pray always mean? Well, it speaks of a continual prayerfulness, a habit of prayer, a lifestyle of prayer, an ongoing dialogue with God through the day, if you will, where morning, noon, and night, prayers are rising up from our hearts and from our lips to our Heavenly Father. That's what we want. And notice at the end of verse 1 that we should not give up on prayer. And the idea most especially, again, remember the context, the idea most especially is that until Christ returns, we are not to give up on prayer. We are to continue to pray. Now, verses 2 to 5, we see the parable itself. It's a pretty simple story. In the parable, there are two characters. There's a judge, and then there's a widow. 
In verse 2, look at how the judge is described. He's described as one who didn't fear God or respect people. Now, Proverbs 9, verse 10 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so it's very clear that this judge is not a wise judge. And the fact that people are made in God's image indicates that we must value them. That should be something that marks this church, that whether we agree or disagree with other people, if they're made in God's image, we should value them. But notice that this judge didn't respect people. In short, Jesus is letting us know that this is an ungodly and wicked judge. Now, for her part, the widow represents the oppressed, uh, people who are powerless in society, people who are in need in society. And again, the story of this parable is a simple one. The, the widow is wronged by another person. We don't have a lot of the details, but they don't ultimately matter. We do know that she's wronged by someone that she describes as her adversary or as her enemy. Jesus doesn't tell us how she had been wronged, and so it's kind of useless for us to speculate about the nature of the wrong she'd suffered. What is clear is that she'd been seriously wronged. And we know she'd been seriously wrong because she continues to come to the judge over and over and over seeking, seeking help, seeking justice. She kept coming to the judge day after day. And initially, look at verse 4, kind of the first part. You see that this wicked judge did nothing about the situation. He didn't care. Again, that just kind of highlights the fact that he's wicked. He's uncaring about those that God has a particular concern for. And later on, though, notice that he's moved to grant her justice. Now, why? Uh, it wasn't because his heart had changed. It wasn't because he was becoming more righteous or concerned. No, the heart of the judge remained the same. It remained wicked. But then in verse 5, you see the thing that convinced him to act. What was it? It was the persistence. It was the persistence of the widow. She kept coming. Literally, the widow wore him down through her persistence. That's what he says. The judge says, because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Now, now, in light of the actions of the judge in verses 6 and 7, the Lord Jesus, he makes his point. Really, it's an argument from lesser to greater. In effect, he says, if the wicked judge is willing to give this widow justice because she perseveres, because she continues to come to him, well, how much more will God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? The point he's making is obvious. God is not a wicked judge. He's a good father, and he cares for his children. And if a wicked judge is willing to act because of persistence, well, we should, we should be persistent in prayer. Why? Because we're not dealing with a wicked judge. We're dealing with a good father who cares for his children. Now, most especially when Jesus says that God will grant them justice, he's referring to ultimate justice. On the day when Christ returns and puts down his enemy, and rescues his people, establishes his kingdom. And so we should continue to pray, come Lord Jesus. Think about it. For 2,000 years, the church has been persevering and praying, come Lord Jesus. And we need to continue to persevere in praying, come Lord Jesus. Why? Because that day is coming. Jesus will return. It's also true, though, that God will answer every prayer that his people pray. And I think this is important. Sometimes God says yes. What we're praying would bring glory to him, and it would be good for our souls. And so he says, yes. And sometimes he says, no, because he knows it wouldn't be good for our souls. And sometimes he says, wait, but he always answers the prayers of his people. So we should pray. Now, now look at the end of verse 8. Notice how Jesus concludes. He says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, these words tell us that when Christ returns, the world is not going to be marked by the kind of perseverance in prayer that would indicate great faith. Uh, Jesus is here telling us, he's letting us know that actually when he comes, the world will be mostly godless and unbelieving. J.C. Ryle put it this way. He said, true faith will be found very scarce at the end of the world. Our Lord teaches that there will be comparatively very few true believers upon earth when he comes again. True faith will be found as rare as it was in the days of Noah, when only eight persons entered the ark, and in the days of Lot, when only four persons left Sodom. Yeah, it's not very encouraging, is it? But looking at the trajectory of the world, it is very believable, isn't it? Isn't it true that the world is rapidly growing darker? It is. Well, this is what the Lord Jesus is teaching us. So looking at verses 1 to 8, you have the Lord Jesus teaching on prayer through this parable, the need for prayer and his encouragement for us to pray 
as a result of his teaching. Now, for the rest of our time this morning, I want us to kind of dive back into this passage, and I want us to focus our hearts on five exhortations that flow out of this passage. And the first is that believers must pray. Look at verse 1. Now, he told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. So note the word need there. In the Greek, this verse can literally be translated, and he was telling them a parable that it is necessary always to pray and not become discouraged. Uh, so setting up the parable, Jesus tells us at the very front, at the very front, he tells us that we have a need here. There's a necessity here for us. Those who follow him must pray. We have a need. Now, because the greater context of this parable is, again, the second coming of the Lord, it indicates that we will have a need to pray until the very end of time until Christ comes again. So here's my question. Why is prayer necessary? Why do we need to pray? Why is it important for us as the people of God to pray? Well, let me give you four reasons very briefly. The first reason, we need to pray because we lack power. Uh, until the Lord Jesus comes, we have a mission. We're not aimless as the people of God. We have a very clearly defined mission. And the mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. That is our mission. The problem is we, in and of ourselves, lack the power we need to complete that mission. Jesus says in John 15, verse 5, apart from me, you can do absolutely nothing. And so until he comes, we have the need to continue to pray that God would give us power to accomplish the mission that he has given us. A second reason we need to pray is because we lack provision. So this goes along with that. But in addition to power, we need wisdom, don't we? And we often lack wisdom. We also need other resources that are necessary to accomplish the task that the Lord has given us. And so we need to pray and ask Him for wisdom and for those resources. For instance, we should pray, Lord, the, the fields are ripe for harvest. Send forth more workers into your harvest. More resources are necessary. And so we continue to pray, asking the Lord to be the one that will provide His church with the resources necessary to accomplish the task. A third reason, we need to pray because our enemies are stronger than we are. If you're just beginning the Christian walk, this is really important for you to understand. You have three enemies in this world primarily, and your enemies are the world and the flesh and the devil. And the world is this system that Satan has set up that entices humanity away from God, and we find it strangely enticing as well. And the flesh is the enemy within that makes us desire things that would dishonor God. Even things that we hate, we find this war within us. And for some reason, we love what we should hate. And then the devil, Satan, well, he's the ruler of this world. And you see, each one of these enemies is stronger than we are. And so we have need to pray each and every day of our Christian lives, Lord, do not bring us into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. There's a fourth reason why we need to pray. We need to pray because it's the nature of Christians to pray. Now, by God's grace, I have four children, and I was there for the birth of each one of my children. And what happens after a child is born is that the doctor takes the child and holds the child up, and the next thing you know, there's this piercing cry of disapproval. It is the nature of the baby to cry and voice complaint about being born. He doesn't like it. It's the nature of babies to cry. Friends, it's the nature of Christians to pray. One of the first things that will happen to you when you follow Jesus is that you will begin to pray. You'll begin to talk to God as your heavenly father. It was that way in the life of the apostle Paul. Here he is on the road to Damascus. Here he is. He has it in his heart to persecute and to imprison and even to kill those who follow Jesus according to the way as Christianity was known at that point. But the Lord Jesus shows up in power and he is converted. And what does he do? He goes on to Damascus, and for the next three days, he is in prayer and fasting. And, and then when the Lord goes to Ananias and tells him, I want you to come and heal Paul, what does he tell him? He says, behold, he's praying. He's, like, and he's letting Ananias know that Paul is living according to his new nature, and that's true of all Christians. You see, Christians must pray because it's the nature of Christians to pray, and that says something very significant. Actually, it's a warning. Friend, if you don't pray, you're not a Christian. You need to understand that. You will live according to your nature. You will do that. And so if it's not in you to pray, you have no concern about praying to God, you're just perfectly happy to live your own life, you don't want to spend time with him or talk to him, it just indicates that you do not possess the life of God within. That's what it means. That's what it means. 
Being a Christian isn't about being religious or going to church or being born into a nation where most people respond that they are Christians on a Gallup poll. That's not what it means to be a Christian. To be a Christian is to be someone who possesses the life of God within. It's someone who is born from above. It's someone who has the Holy Spirit of God, a spirit of adoption that that teaches us to cry out, Abba, Father. And if you don't have that, friends, you're not a Christian. You don't have the real thing. You've got a counterfeit. And what you need is the real thing. And praise God, the real thing is available. Robert Murray McShane put it this way. He said, Christ loved secret prayer. Ah, you are no Christian if you do not love secret prayer. Oh, brethren, a prayerless man is an unconverted man. So in verse 1, we see that Christians must pray. There's a second exhortation. Believers must, or excuse me, should pray persistently. Look at verse 1 and then verse 3. Verse 1 again. Now he told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. And now look at verse 3. And a widow in that town kept coming to him saying, Give me justice against my adversary. So looking at this parable, just kind of on the face of it, you see very clearly that one of the main themes is this issue of persistence. In verse 1, Jesus says, you must pray always and not give up. And then in verse 3, the widow embodies this persistence by coming to the judge over and over and over until he grants her justice. And the obvious implication is that believers should be characterized by persistent prayer. But what is persistent prayer? Well, look again at the example of the widow. What did she do? Well, persistent prayer, it's continual prayer that never gives up, and that's what the widow did. She came to the judge over and over and over. She came continually, and notice that she never gave up until she achieved the goal of getting justice, and that is what our prayers are to be like. Now, Christ Fellowship 2023 looms before us, and no one in this room has any idea what will happen. The news tells us every day that there are all kinds of dread possibilities like another pandemic, economic recession, political turmoil. And you know what? All of those are very real possibilities for the year 2023. We would be fools not to acknowledge that. And if we're not careful, we will be mentally consumed by all of these dread possibilities. Friends, I'm praying for something better for Christ Fellowship in 2023. I'm praying that we will fix our mind on the mission that's been given to us. And the mission we've been given is to what? To make disciples of Jesus Christ. So I'm praying that God will help us to do that. But if we're going to do that, if we're going to accomplish the task that has been given to us, we must be marked by prayer, by a continual prayer that doesn't give up, by this persistent prayer that we see modeled for us in the life of the widow here. So by God's grace, let's be a church that's marked by continual prayer. That starts with each one of us, members of the church individually. It starts with our own walk with God as we day by day spend time with Him in prayer, as we make it a priority. Uh, And let me encourage you, find a specific time to pray, set that side apart, don't let anything get in the way, pray then, and then from that, pray throughout the rest of the day. Spend time with God. But it's more than just individuals. Again, it's our Bible studies. It's our community groups. Uh, It's when just two or three of our members gather together to to talk with one another, to hold one another accountable, or to read a good book together. We should be praying on Sunday mornings. We should be praying corporately as a church. I find it very easy when someone else is praying the pastoral prayer to mentally check out. I'm hearing the words, but I'm not laboring in prayer. Maybe you've discovered that in your own heart. Well, corporately, we should be praying together during the service and fixing our minds in that way and then in a special way. On the third Sunday evening of every month, we have a corporate prayer service, and I just want to encourage you to come to that. I want to encourage you to come to that so that we as a church can corporately pray together. Uh, God will use that time. It's something we're trying to grow in as a church. I know we're all busy. And I'm not here to guilt you this morning. This is an invitation to spend time with Jesus, with your brothers and sisters. And I just want to invite you to come. But if we are to do that, if we are to be faithful, continual, persistent in prayer, we cannot give up. Isn't it easy to give up on prayer? Isn't that easy to do? We can begin praying for good things, like that God would help us to see more people saved in 2023. That's a great prayer. But then if we don't immediately see something, we we can stop praying. We can listen to the devil who tells us it's worthless. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean something. Uh, Prayer is powerless. 
and we can become discouraged and we can stop. Well, we must not do that. You see, the temptation will come. And when it comes, may God give us the grace to remember the widow in this parable who continued to come and continued to ask and continued to seek. She didn't give up. There's a third exhortation flowing out of this passage. It's that believers should pray fervently. So look at verse 3 and then verse 5. Uh, verse 3, and a widow in that town kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. And in verse 5, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Now, how do you imagine that this widow came to the judge? Do you think that she just quietly came up and said, kind sir, I need justice? And then when he did nothing, did she just quietly turn around and walk away? Uh, no, when you read this parable, it becomes very clear that that's not at all what she was doing. It's pretty clear that she was passionate. Uh, she was pestering. She was wearing him out. She was imploring. She was even demanding justice over and over and over. She was fervent in her demands until she literally wore the judge out. Now, that's a picture of the kind of prayers we should be praying to God. Not cold and disinterested prayers, but focused and fervent prayers where we are engaged from the heart. After all, if we don't actually want what we're praying for, why should God pay any attention to us? Well, sadly, if you're like me, you prayed many cold and disinterested prayers in your life. Sadly, if you're like me in your morning quiet times, you found it very easy to go through the motions of praying without actually praying. And you don't realize until a few minutes in that you're not actually praying. You're thinking about something else, what it shouldn't be. Instead, when we pray, we should take ourselves at hand. I'm trying to learn how to do this. Pray for me that I will. Take yourself in hand and think about what we're doing. We're approaching the God of eternity. Well, he's the king of glory. Uh, and what a privilege it is for us to pray. But then think about the fact that he's our father. So he's, he's invited us to come. And so we don't have to come fearfully. We can come boldly. And, and then with that truth in our hearts, we, we go to him in prayer. And we, we ask that, that he would work, that he would help, that he would glorify his name through us. Not praying cold and disinterested prayers, but praying fervent prayers. Not going through the motions but truly praying. I like what Charles Spurgeon said about fervent prayer. He said, some people's prayers have no work in them. Prayer that prevails with God is a real working man's prayer. It is prayer where the petitioner like Samson shakes the gates of mercy and labors to pull them up rather than be denied an interest. We do not want fingertip prayers that barely touch the burden. We need shoulder prayers that bear the load of earnestness and are not to be denied their desire. We do not want those dainty runaway knocks at the doors of mercy that some give when they perform for others at prayer meetings. We ask for the knocking of a man who means to stop at mercy's gate till it opens and all his need shall be supplied. So by God's grace in 2023, let's pray fervent, kind of mercy gate shaking prayers and trust God to answer those prayers. A fourth exhortation, believers should pray confidently. Uh, this, again, on the surface is one of the things that are most clear of this passage. Look at verse 6 and 7. Jesus says, Then the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay helping them? I tell you, he will swiftly grant them justice. Now, this is one of the most beautiful truths about this passage. And you see it in verse 6 and 7. God is nothing like the wicked judge. He's not like that. He's not unconcerned. He doesn't drag his feet. Uh, he doesn't only answer the prayers of his people because his people wear him down to make him do something he doesn't care to do. That's not how God is. The testimony of the Bible is that God is generous and he's kind and he's good and he hears our prayers and he's concerned and he wants us to come and ask him. And he says, you don't have because you don't ask. And he invites us to come and to pray and to ask. It's the kind of God that we serve. And that's what Jesus points out. He says, you know, will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? And the expected answer there is, of course he will. Of course he'll grant justice. Of course he'll respond to their prayers. Now, again, most especially in this passage, grant them justice. It's talking about what will happen when Christ returns and defeats all of his enemies and he rescues his people and he brings in his kingdom. So, again, the primary focus of this parable is eschatological. 
But it's equally true that God stands ready to answer all the prayers of his elect. Who are they? Well, they are the people upon whom he placed his love in eternity past. The elect are those he's chosen for salvation from before the very foundation of the earth. Now, God doesn't always say yes to our prayers, does he? I mean, how many prayers have you prayed where it seemed like nothing happened? I prayed a lot like that. And there's a reason. God's a good father, and he knows that many of the things we ask for in prayer would not be good for us spiritually. So sometimes he says no, but he always responds. Sometimes he says, wait. Why? Because he wants us to pray. He wants us to come into his presence more and more, asking him more and more to do what he ultimately will do in his good time. And so we wait, and we wait in fervent and persistent prayer. And often, often, isn't it true? Often he says, yes, yeah, sometimes I'm just surprised. I, I'll pray for something, and it'll be a, it's a pathetic prayer. You know, someone will tell me about a trouble that someone in the church has, and I'll throw up a three-second prayer, you know, bless Betsy. And, uh, and he does. And it's amazing. And then I want to have prayed more than a three-second bless Betsy prayer, but, but praise God. He said yes, right? He said yes. He answered the prayer. And it's encouraging. It encourages us to pray more. Why? Our God responds. He never ignores our prayer. So when Satan whispers in your ear, God doesn't care about you and your prayers are worthless, he's lying. That's what Satan does. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. So when he tells you something that doesn't line up with Scripture, you know he's lying to you. And what Scripture says is that God is a good father, and he cares. And so pray. So two applications. Let's repent of harboring wrong thoughts about God. Some of us need to repent this morning because for too long we have viewed God like this unjust and wicked judge who doesn't actually care, who just kind of drags his feet who maybe he answers the prayers of other people, but he doesn't really care about me. He doesn't answer my prayers. He's not good to me. No, the evil judge in the parable is unconcerned. He's unkind. He's even stingy. God is none of those things. He's gracious and good and faithful. That's the testimony of Scripture. And you see it most, especially at the cross, what God comes into the world in order to experience death on behalf of his people so that they might be rescued. The eternal Son of God did that. As a church, let's pray. So here's the application. Let's pray like God is a good father. All right? So we get it into our minds. God is a good father. The one I'm approaching in prayer is a good father, and so I'm going to pray like that, and I'm going to trust that he's going to say yes, or he's going to say no, or he's going to say wait, but I know he's good, and I'm going to pray like he's good, and I'm going to mean it. And I'm going to trust him to be faithful. Let's pray bold, God-exalting, confident prayers in 2023. Let's pray for more salvation through our evangelistic efforts, for more opportunities to share the gospel, for eyes to see them, for boldness to take them. Let's pray in particular for our children. Let's pray that our children, whether they are young or old, that they would come to faith in Christ. Let's pray for struggling marriages, that they'd be restored, for wayward children, that they would repent. The families would be restored. Let's pray that there would be no bitterness. There would be no brokenness of relationship in our church. I'm unaware of any. I praise God for that. But let's pray that there would be none of that and that we would instead love one another. And when we sin against one another, that we would humbly reconcile with one another. Let's pray that our church would make an impact on the campus of William and Mary this year. It matters that we're in a town that has a college where 7,000 undergraduates gather, many of whom are going to have great impact in this world. That matters. And it's not happenstance. God put us here. And we have an opportunity here to impact that college. Let's pray that God would help us do that. What a joy it would be to see many young men and women come to faith in Christ because of the evangelistic efforts of our church. Let's pray that our short-term mission trips to Guinea and North Africa and Central Asia would be used of God in this coming year to bless those workers we're spending time with, uh, and that we'd be able to do fruitful, meaningful work there that would be an encouragement to them and would glorify God. And let's pray that God would give us a new building. We have been praying for that. The point of this parable is what? Keep praying. Keep asking God to do it. And let's pray that he would do it in a way that magnifies his generosity and his wisdom and his goodness. 
We should confidently pray these prayers and others like this because we're praying to a good father. And so may God help us do that in 2023. There's a final exhortation. Believers should pray urgently. Look at the end of verse 8. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, again, in verse 8, Jesus is speaking of what things will be like when he returns upon the earth. And while he sounds incredibly confident in verse 6 and 7 that God is a God who will hear the prayers of his elect and he will answer those prayers, when you get to the end of verse 8, he doesn't sound very confident at all about the state of the faith of the world when he returns, does he? Actually, no, he indicates that the kind of faith that leads to persevering prayer will be lacking, that faith will be at a low ebb. And it is true that faith, true faith, is at a low ebb in America. I don't think I need to defend that statement, but I can. Friends, pornography is everywhere. It's everywhere. Last week, I saw a pickup truck driving down Interstate 64, and on the side of a truck was a large advertisement for a well-known pornographic website. And he's just proudly advertising that. 20 years ago, it would have been utterly unthinkable. Uh, increasingly, being a committed Bible-believing Christian in the public sphere puts you in the crosshair of a culture that is determined to act like each person is a god unto himself. And so you can lose your job, you can lose your promotion, you can lose your tenure at major corporations or colleges if you simply state what the Bible clearly teaches on any number of social issues. That's simply true. That's how it is. Tragically, faith is at a low ebb in many churches as well. Um, the risk of sounding like a bit of a curmudgeon, I think it's true. Many worship services at churches look more like a Las Vegas rock concert than a gathering of God's people. It's just true. That, that is, that's true. There are lots and lots of songs, but I think it's very telling that there is precious little or if any prayer. It's a lot of music, a lot of smoke, a lot of lasers. I'm not saying that smoke and music and lasers is wrong. I'm just saying it doesn't look any different than a rock concert. And I have a little bit of concern about that. Because when we gather together as the people of God, it's not a worship experience. That's not what we're doing. You're, you're not here to sit in a chair and watch people do stuff for you. You're the body. You're here to serve one another in love, to build up the body in love, to speak the truth in love. And we do that before the service, and we do that after the service. We're talking about committed love here, where I come to church not to sit back and experience something, but I come to work. And that's why we call it a worship service, right? It's a service. We're serving God. And by His grace, we're serving others as well. Many pastors sound more like life coaches than heralds of the gospel. Evangelism is lacking because we love our personal comfort more than we love telling people about Jesus who they desperately need to know. True faith is at a low ebb in America, but it does not have to be at a low ebb in Christ's fellowship. In fact, it must not be that. It must not be that. And we need God to give us his grace in 2023 that it would not be that case with us, but instead that this would be a year of fervency and growth and passion, and commitment, and pursuit, and service, and looking for opportunities to make much of Christ. This year's an opportunity, 2023. The world wants it to be an opportunity for us to go day by day looking at the latest dread headline so that we can constantly live in fear. That is an option for your 2023. Friend, let me encourage you not to live that way. Jesus wins, and you have a mission. And the mission is to make disciples. And it doesn't matter at all what happens to you or your health. It doesn't. Because your soul is safe with God. And you can lose everything you own and God will provide for you. And you can get an illness. And you can die. And you'll go be with Jesus forever and ever and ever. Friend, we have everything we need to live differently. I'm praying we will. I'm praying we will. And we'll live differently that we won't think like this herd of humanity that is constantly terrified because we're saved. We're saved. Oh, may God help us. 
May God help us be about the work of the ministry. May God help us. It's an opportunity to see God move in dramatic ways as we together ask him to do so. Remember that and don't give up part. Praying that God would move in dramatic ways. In our, but then we don't see anything in January. We're like, well, I'm done with that. God's not going to answer that prayer. No, we pray throughout 2023 saying, God, move in dramatic ways in Christ's fellowship. Help us grow. Help us be like Jesus. Help us reach this world. We want to be a bright light in an increasingly dark world. And friend, don't you feel inadequate for that? But you, but you see, you, you are and I am. We are inadequate. But Jesus isn't. And it's his life being lived through us by his spirit in this year. May God do all of this and much more. Now, friends, before we, before we conclude the service, let me say something to you. If you're, if you're not following Christ, you're hearing this is, in many ways, this parable is directly talking to believers about this act of prayer where we're just talking with our Father. And we, we understand that you don't have that relationship. We understand. So this can just go past you. So I want to talk to you this morning because you haven't yet followed Jesus. Perhaps, perhaps you're just beginning to feel the darkness of this world in a way that you haven't before. And you're not sure what to do about it. Perhaps you're just sensing for the first time that there's a darkness within you and you're not sure what to do about it. Well, friend, we have good news for you. We have the best possible news. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the Savior that God has provided for sinners like me, like everyone around you this morning, and friend, like you. You see, the Bible's so clear about who we are. The Bible says we're made in the image of God. That's why man is able to do noble and good things. And yet that image has been marred because our first parents rebelled against God in the garden and sinned, and we sinned in them. And because we come from them, we've inherited that same nature of rebellion against God, which doesn't look like I write a best-selling book about why I hate God. It just looks like I live each and every day as if I am God, as if what I want is the most important thing. And I have no concern about the God of eternity, the one who keeps me alive each and every moment. Instead, I'm just living for myself and pursuing my own things. Friends, friends, it's that rebellion against God who the Bible calls sin. And it takes different forms. Sometimes it looks quite secular. Sometimes it looks quite religious. You see, what, what the Bible teaches is not that we're supposed to try to be good enough for God, that we're to clean ourselves up, that we're to read the Bible more, that we're to pray, that we're to be nice Christian-y people. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, believe on the one that the Father has sent. That's Jesus. Turn from your sin and trust in Christ. He's the Savior. How did he save us? He came into this world, the eternal Son of God, and he lived a perfect life because you and I have failed to live a perfect life. He did that with intentionality, always fulfilling the law of God. And then he willingly went to the cross as a sacrifice, bearing in himself the wrath of God against the sins of all who will turn from their sins and trust in him. He died, but then he rose from the dead. And that's the gospel. That's the good news of what Christ has done. And then the Bible tells us there's a way to respond to that message. And the way we respond to that message is by turning. I acknowledge my sin before God, uh, my rebellion against him, and I'm going to turn from that, and now I'm going to put all of my trust in Christ. I'm going to rest on Christ the same way each one of you is resting on your chair this morning. Putting all of your weight on Jesus, saying it's his perfect life that matters. It's his sacrificial death that matters. I'm going to put myself in his hands. I'm going to cry out for mercy from him. And he's going to grant me eternal life because that's the promise. All who turn from their sins and trust in Jesus, they receive eternal life now. And that life goes on forever. And all of their sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. And they are adopted as sons and daughters of God. And you see, friend, it's a free gift. You cannot earn it, so don't try to earn it. Oh, I have conversations with people, and they say, I'm trying to be a Christian. You can't try to be a Christian. That's not the point. The point is, trust in Jesus. Put your hope in him and him alone, and God will save you. Oh, if you want to talk with someone about that, I would love to talk with you after the sermon. You're, you're surrounded by people who would love to talk with you about the gospel, the good news of Jesus that we just talked about this morning. Friend, you will find, if you trust in Jesus, that because he is the light of the world, he will, he will be light for you. He will become your all. And you will never regret following him. You never will. 
Well, we've heard five exhortations about prayer. Believers must pray. Believers should pray persistently. Believers should pray fervently. Believers should pray confidently. And believers should pray urgently. And as I look at those truths, I confess to you that I'm still a learner in this school of prayer. And I think many of us are. And that means that 2023 is an opportunity for us to press further into our relationship with God through prayer. And to not give up. And to not become discouraged. And to not grow weary, but instead, like this persistent widow, to keep on and keep on and keep on. And God will accomplish good things in this church in this coming year. May he do it. Let's pray. Lord God, we are asking that you, the King of kings and our Father, would glorify your name by helping us be a people who are dependent upon you. Oh, we are dependent upon you but we don't realize it in our pride. And in our pride, we try to act as if we are competent, as if we can do things on our own, as if we can even do ministry in our own power. Lord God, we can't. We pray that you would humble us and open our eyes to see our need and show us our need in such a way that we do not despair, but instead strengthen us by your spirit so that we would instead run to Jesus and find fresh life in him and grace through him. Oh, Father, we pray that we would be a church that walks closely with you in this coming year, would you do that good work? And I pray especially for those who are here this morning who do not know you. Lord, I pray that you would impress upon them the truth of the good news about Jesus, and they would find life in him today, and they would follow him. And Lord, that you would grant salvation today. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, I can think of no better way to respond to God's word and to begin a new year than by taking the Lord's Supper together. The Lord's Supper is a picture of the gospel that we just talked about, of Christ willing to have his body broken for us, willing to have his blood shed for us so that we might be forgiven for our sins. That's what the bread symbolizes. It's what the cup symbolizes. The bread symbolizes the, the breaking of Christ's body. The blood is the shedding of his, of his body. The, the, uh, the juice is the shedding of his blood. Both of them together show us a picture of the gospel that we're putting our hope in. And, and we get to take that together by faith. And the Holy Spirit uses that as a means of grace to make us like Jesus. So it's a very significant thing for us to be able to do. It's also significant because it gives us an opportunity for us to come to God in prayer, as we've been talking about, and to ask Him to have dealings with us regarding our own heart and our relationship with Him. Uh, and so perhaps there are things this morning that the Holy Spirit is going to press on you in terms of sins that you need to turn away from. This is an opportunity to turn away from those sins and come and welcome to Jesus because, because this supper is for sinners who have found Jesus to be an all-sufficient Savior. Oh, but if there's sin in your life that you're clinging to, and even though you feel convicted, you're unwilling to let it go, friend, it might be better for you not to take the supper and to think about your relationship with God. But don't stay there. Talk with someone about what's going on because what Christ wants and what we want for you as a church is we want you to be right with God. And so we'd want you to talk with us about that so we could pray with you and try to help you and encourage you and trust that God would move in that way. If you're with us this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus, we're glad that you are here. You're always welcome at Christ Fellowship. Uh, this is really a family meal where we are celebrating what Christ has done for us. And so, so this meal is for those who are trusting in what those elements symbolize, uh, what Christ has done. So we'd ask you, if you have not trusted in Christ for salvation, that you would not participate with us this morning. Uh, this, is a, this is a supper that is given to believers, to those who walk in obedience to Christ. Uh, so if you're trusting in Christ alone this morning, you've been obedient to Christ in baptism, we'd encourage you to take the Lord's Supper with us this morning, whether you're a part of Christ's fellowship or just visiting with us this morning. Let me read the words of uh, instruction about the Lord's Supper from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, in giving this instruction, I do not praise you since you come together not for better but for worse. Let me skip down, excuse me, a little further down. Verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I'm going to ask the men who are helping us distribute the elements if they would come now. Uh, the table is to my right. and ask if you would get that ready. And then Dan Roper is going to play for us. And let's use the next few moments while the elements are being prepared and then passed out to us. Let's use the next few moments to pray, uh, to think about our relationship with the Lord, to, to uh, repent as needed, to be encouraged as needed, to pray for others as the Lord leads us to. And then we will take the elements together. So I'd ask you to hold on to them and not take them so that we can take them together once they are fully distributed. Let me lead us in a prayer before they are distributed. Lord God, as these elements come to us, they remind us of the saving act of Christ who allowed his body to be broken for us and his blood shed for us. Uh, they are symbols of his sacrifice. And through them, by your spirit, we receive uh, grace, sanctification. You make us more like the Lord Jesus because we see the gospel here. And so we pray that you would give us eyes of faith, uh, Lord, that we would worship you rightly in our hearts and that you'd be honored. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you on the night when he was betrayed. The Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice for us. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread, the, um, the cup together, remembering Christ's blood was shed for us. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so let's pray together. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to conclude our service just by singing the doxology this morning. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. That was beautiful. Please be seated. Use the next, use the next few moments to think about what you've heard, and then I will... Conclude our time with an amen.